The prior for freedom was free up the land. Free up the land that we can free the people. So they were successful in many aspects to free the land of direct occupation of colonial rule. But that was the beginning. It was not the end. Because the Bible still continued. Because it wasn't only our land that was colonized with false demarcations and borders. More importantly than our land having been divided up and colonized and more criminal to our existence was the colonization of our minds. Hey, what's up, everybody? Thank you for checking me out. My name is Eko Simpson. I'm a Ghanaian. Um, and I live in Ghana. Well, you are watching this channel because somebody introduced you to it. It was recommended or suggested to you on YouTube. Basically, my YouTube channel is to connect Africans and the motherland to Africans in the diaspora. So, thank you for checking me out. If this is your first time of watching my videos, kindly subscribe to my YouTube channel. And it is that struggle for liberation that continues. We must continue to liberate our minds. That's why one of our greatest songsters of the 20th century, Robert Lester Marley, whom we call Bob Marley, wrote a song that he called Redemption Song. And within that song, he had a verse of lyrics that said, Emancipate yourself from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. We cannot expect that the same people that came to rape and to rob our continent, not only of our gold and our diamonds and our bauxite, but of the very souls of our people, which is the greatest resource that this land ever had that it gave to the world, was African people. And in that process, we realized that they also attempted to steal our minds and in many aspects, they were successful. But not our souls. Our souls remain within our own possession. And it's with that soul and with that spirit that if we recognize that our minds have been tampered with, we can wake up and be on the quest to have our proper mind restored to us. But we must first realize that our minds have been infiltrated. I started off with time because if we don't know how to tell time, we can't operate and any other task. You know, when you go to sleep at night, some of us, you know, you have dreams, some good dreams, some bad dreams. And when you're in the middle of that dream, you have no idea that you're in a dream because you think it's real. You don't even know that you're asleep. You forgot that you fell asleep because you're in the middle of an episode. The only time that you know that you were asleep is when you wake up. No sleeping man know he's asleep. A sleeping man only knows that he will sleep when he wakes up or someone wakes him up. And as long as you're in that dream, you think that dream is a reality until you come out of that dream. So we too must wake up out of the sleep and the slumber that we've been put in under somebody else's dominance and rule. Today, the topic was the state of the race. So that means that we talk about the state of our race, this is not just a Ghanaian conversation. This is not a Nigerian conversation. This is not an African-American conversation, a Jamaican conversation, or a Brazilian conversation. This is a conversation about the totality of our people in the four corners of the earth. The state of our race. Each president of each country has a responsibility to give a state of the nation. But well, we're here today because we're here to do somewhat touch on. We will not finish this topic today. Just like Nano Bekesi asked our illustrious cultural group here to ginger me up before I speak. This is only meant to ginger you up <laughs> as the first of a series of programs. It took four to five hundred years to put us in the state that we're in now. It's going to take more than the 45 minutes that I've been given to bring 400 years of programming out of our minds. 
It's going to take a process. When the assignment for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, the first president of the Republic of Ghana, when he was setting down the foundation of this new nation, he knew that it was not enough to sign documents in the parliament to say that we were free. In fact, in 1957, when the independence of Ghana was brought into manifestation, we realized that we still were not a republic. We still had the queen as the head of state. You still had someone that, not, that was not in the image and the likeness of any of our lovely and beautiful queen mothers. So it said something was wrong. That's why we have an Independence Day and a Republic Day. Because it took to 1960 to get a republic. Because he realized the freedom, the process of freedom had not been complete, that we were still on a journey. And he realized that one of the most valuable institutes that he established was the Ideological Institute. The Ideological Institute was established because he realized, like I said, the signing of a document by a lawyer class or political class of our representatives did not represent real freedom in the minds of our people who have been under oppression and under attack for centuries. So he realized that now that we have proclaimed that we're independent, and even three years later, now that we have proclaimed that we are an independent republic, now we must begin to work on changing the minds of the people away from the programming that has been put into them under a foreign rule and under British rule and under all the attacks that we've had of all the foreign nations that have come to the former Gold Coast. To name us outside of our names, we must have an ideological institute to work on changing our minds to think like free people and be African. You see the experience that we had to undergo. Somebody named us after a commodity that they had interest in. They named us gold coasters like we had no name. Because they were after gold, after the riches that we had, that God had blessed us with in our soil. They didn't think about our persons. They didn't think about our personality. They didn't think about our humanity. They didn't think about our culture. They just came to our land and named us the Gold Coast after a piece of metal. They went next door because we had forests and herds of elephants and they were after ivory and the value of ivory. They named our brothers and sisters next door the Ivory Coast. The biggest area that houses us all, where we have more Africans than any other place on the territory of Mother Africa, Nigeria. It's called Nigeria. area. You hear what I said? Nigeria is called Nigger area. They said there's more niggas there than anywhere else in the world. That's the insult. You know what Cameroon Cameroon means? Cameroon means shrimp. Because the first Portuguese white man that went to that territory saw the biggest shrimp he'd ever seen in the lakes there. So he named the people shrimp. They stole our mind. They made it a crime for you to remember your ancestors. They made it a crime for you to perform rituals that called on your ancestors. They gave you new ancestors. They gave you new gods. And while they flourished, in our land. They rose above us and put us under their foot in our land. We all saw what the police officer did in the United States of America last year with George Floyd. The whole world saw it. It's only today they're trying to choose a jury this week to bring that crime to justice. But it's not just George Floyd. The white police officer was an officer. He wasn't a renegade. He wasn't a criminal, even though that was a criminal act. He wore a uniform. He was empowered. He was an officer of the law. But the law of the land is you can do anything to a black man, anything to a person of African descent, and you have no dignity because we don't respect your humanity. They 
classified us outside of the human family and they began to associate, associate us with apes and monkeys and they have no shame with it. It's in their history books. They write that we're not even human. So they even taught us to disrespect ourselves. They even taught us not to like ourselves. The number one cosmetic selling on the African continent, selling in the world, is skin bleaching cream. Because we want to be white. Because they taught us to hate our blackness. They taught us that black was evil. They taught us that black was a sin. They taught us that black was negative. So we begin to hate ourselves. Our men and our women, they go to the drugstore, they spend money. It's not even free. They spend money to put cream on to be white. Even they look like spotted leopards. Look at their hands, look at their ankles, look at their feet. They look deformed. But they think it's beautiful. They even have white spots. They think it's the beginning of their path towards beauty. They taught us that God was white. We got a white man with long hair, with a beard. And we say it's Jesus, that it's God. It's a lie. He's in our homes, he's in our living room, he's in our car, he's on the chochos. So even our children unborn, when they see any white man, they say, that's God. Yes, sir, master. Yes, sir, boss. We can't do anything. I'm talking about our state that we're in. I got some good news, too, but we got to start from where we at. The doctor has to do a diagnosis of what are we sick with before he can write a prescription about how to get better. And we cannot be better if the image of God is not in our own image. The Bible opens up and says that man was created in the image of God. Are we not men? Are we not women? Cannot God look like us? The very same patriots in the Bible, when they went to Europe, they went there with black images. Jesus was black. Mary was black. All the patriots were black. But they were wise enough to know that if we are to accept this and we are to advance, let's paint their pictures white so they look like us so we can have some self-esteem and pride. I don't fault them for that. But I do fault us. How can we let the image of our oppressor, who's never done anything good for us, be the image that we worship God at? What happened to our ancestors? When we ignore them, they ignore us. When we turn our back on them, they turn our back on us. They are there. They are alive. And they're ready to assist us when we get serious of wanting to be ourselves. But when we want to copy someone else and be like them, we can never be the white man, brothers and sisters. We can never be him. As much as you try, you can't bleach. You can't learn his language and talk it better than him. You can't walk like him. You don't want to walk like him. He can't carry nothing on his head. So it means he ain't got no balance. We can carry something on our head because we are balanced and we're balanced because we've been walking on this earth longer than any other human being so we know the rhythm of the earth. We know who the Sasi is. We are the people of this earth. We are the original people of this earth. That's why we are the color of the earth. This rich culture that we've seen on display here, is that an ignorant people? That are people that come out of jungles and forests and living in trees. The display of that dance that has meaning to it, the rhythm of those drums, look at the resilience and look at the elegance and look at the majesty of the dress of our kings and our queen mothers and the jewelry and the adornment. That's a proud people. But they lie to 
us. Those of us they took away from here, they lied and said, your ancestors lived like animals in jungles. They lived in trees. That they had no culture. They had no language. So when our people call upon in Yom Kippur, and they don't understand that, they say you're worshiping a devil, kill him. When you call on the Yame, they don't understand your language, they don't know what that means. They say you call him on a demon, kill him. We had to suffer because of their ignorance. If we didn't call on God the way they want us to call on him, they say that you was a pagan. But all of the same patriarchs in that Bible that we read in the Quran, Abraham made sacrifice to call upon God. He was even going to the extent of sacrificing his own son before God said, there's a ram in the thicket. <laughs> David, Solomon, all of them poured libations. They believed in sacrifice. That's how they called on God. They believe in their ancestors. That's why the Holy Book calls all those ancestors. Our foundation is the foundation of spirituality in the world. All of them come from us. Every meaningful spiritual denomination today that says it's a credible religion has its foundation in African spirituality on this continent. Europe gave birth to not one single major religion. And our ancestors who brought to them the understanding of the concept of God and how to worship God and how to give reverence to God. So when we look at our situation. I want to go back to an episode. The further drive on this topic, the state of the race. We have a global pandemic going on now. And at the beginning of this global pandemic, all of the pronosticators have predicted that Africa would have millions of people dying, either laying in the streets. African people be dying so fast you couldn't make it to the hospital. You'd be driving, dying in the car. Get out your car and die and fall on the ground. Bill Gates' wife, one of the biggest propagators of the vaccines, had predicted that millions of Africans would be dying all over Africa. But guess what? The Most High God and our ancestors had another plan. We found out that millions of them were dying. Packed up in trucks. Refrigerated trucks, people couldn't see their ancestors in the hospital, people didn't know whether they were dead or alive. They had a horror story coming out of the Americas and out of Europe. Now they got money, they got scientists doing research to find out why Africans are not dying. What's wrong with them they're not dying? We spent all this money making this plan to send out a disease that would get rid of them, and they ain't dying, we dying. Now you gotta understand me now, don't think there's no exaggeration. Because the only way that the United States of America is existing is because the Europeans had a plan that that land is rich and most of us are poor. If we can remove the people from the land and take the riches of the land, we can be rich and they can be no more. That's why the average one of us don't know what a Native American looks like. We get stories about the Indian. We have stories about the Native American, but you don't see them. They don't count in our world because their whole land was taken away from them. And it wasn't only by the gun or by the spear or by the sword. You know what it was? The European came in contact with them and contracted their diseases and they died off. 70 million indigenous Americans died in five years after the white man made contact with America. 70 million died. In the 14th century, they had a black plague in Europe that over half of the Europeans died from a disease and a plague. They came into Africa and came into the Americas with that disease. But even then, Africans didn't die from their disease. This melanated black skin that God put medicine in. God put medicine in your black skin. That, mel that medicine is called melanin. 
is put in there to protect you and keep you in contact and in tune with the universe. But there's something that you must do to maintain your frequency. You have cell phones today. And the cell phone is geared to give you what's up, to give you Facebook, to give you internet. But there's something that you must do to maintain your frequency. You got to keep buying those credits. You don't buy those credits, you ain't got no frequency. In other words, there's a responsibility that you have to keep your frequency, and there's a responsibility that we have to keep our frequency with our melanin to understand how to let it talk to us and we talk to it. And part of that is being upright according to the laws that our ancestors taught us and living correct with each other. We're not the people to learn the ways of the white man where it's convenient to lie to one another and it's all right. It's convenient to steal from one another and it's all right. We come from a culture that we didn't need locks on our doors because we believed that if you stole something, something would happen to you. We lived in a community that we were protected because we believe in ourselves. We didn't believe that our word should be contaminated by telling our fellow brother a word that's not the truth. So we got we're comfortable with lying to one another. Who taught us that? If Africa is a corrupt country with corrupt politicians today, who taught us that corruptness? And who taught us how to take a bribe? If we come back to the original way that we know there's a path in that, that we can go forward and see the light. 